Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today. Welcome to the 8th Chicago African Summit. Distinguished friends, participants, sisters, and brothers, thank you so much for spending most of your day with us today. And first of all, we'd like to thank Khan TV for covering this event for cable and online viewers. This program is being cablecast live today on Khan TV channel 27 and streaming live at cantv.org forward slash watch. And of course, information about Khan TV programming could be found at cantv.org. And for an organization such as the United African Organization, we value the inimitable role that Can TV plays in providing a platform for multiple and diverse voices in Chicago. We start this year's summit, ladies and gentlemen, in remembrance of Nelson Mandela, the African freedom fighter and statesman, and Maya Angelou, the people's poet. Their transition to the world of our ancestors gives us reason to reflect on the deeper meaning of their lives. Mandela understood the essence of the struggle of the African people for liberation and dignity. He dedicated his life to that long walk to freedom and lived to see the birth of a new South Africa. Maya Angelou's words today and forever will enrich our lives in ways that will enshrine her name among the pantheons of the world's greatest literary figures of all time. Maya's life traversed many continents, including Africa, and her voice carried the deep cadence of the African-American struggle to hold the United States of America true to its self-proclaimed ideals. Maya Angelou continued to inspire the rest of us and in ways that will make us continue that journey forward to a society in which Dr. Martin Luther King's dream will be an unshakable foundation. Just as Mandela's example will give us the roadmap to complete our journey to its logical conclusion, which is the establishment of a united and democratic Africa. We are proud to dedicate this year's Chicago African Summit to the memory of and legacy of Comrade Nelson Mandela and our shining queen and weaver of words, Dr. Maya Angelou. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to take this opportunity, first of all, to thank our leaders, members, staff, and interns and volunteers of the United African Organization for the work we do every day to advance social justice and opportunity in our community. It is this call to action and service that keeps us going, forging strategic and principled alliances with others who are in the trenches of various struggles and reminding each other that we live in a permanent state of interconnected aspirations. The struggle of the undocumented immigrants in the shadow of our society is not an isolated outburst, but an integral part of the various struggles around us, including marriage equality for LGBTQs to civil liberty for Arab and Muslim Americans, and the fight against neoliberal assault on public education in our city today in the form of closing schools in black and brown communities and attacking hardworking teachers. That is why, as an organization, we stand with allies like Affinity Community Services, Arab American Action Network, and Kenwood Oakland Community Organization to address common issues by engaging those who are directly affected by them. My friends, all struggles for social justice are branches of the same tree, rooted in the same soil, and nurtured by hope, courage, and above all, faith in the power of ordinary people to change the world for the better. Our strength lies in the interconnection of our branches, not in the silos that we often create and defend with exclusive attitudes and agendas. That is why Audrey Lord so cogently noted that there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Hence, my friends, we cannot say we are for marriage equality but against immigration reform. We cannot fight for civil rights and against immigrant rights. In the same vein, we cannot say we are for immigration reform, but missing in action in the fight for all the other important issues that affect our communities. Immigrant rights activists should re not reduce all struggles to only the quest for immigration reform. That kind of attitude breeds opportunistic partnerships and suspicion about intention and actions and makes it harder to foster genuine solidarity in cross-issue organizing. 
distinguished guests, comrades, and allies. It is heart-wrenching to see the devastating impact of mass deportation on our communities. Every single day, families are separated by the dragnet of a deportation policy that sows fear and destabilizes our community. President Obama does not need to wait for Congress to do something about mass deportation. He can use administrative powers today to halt it if Republicans want to delay immigration reform for political advantage. One thing is certain, my friends, immigrant and Latino communities will remember in November. Our vote will send a clear message that we want immigration reform and we want it now. We will continue our campaign to ensure that uh, immigration reform includes the diversity visa program. The program has been working quite well, but unfortunately, last year, Senate Bill 744 excluded this program in their bill in an attempt to appease Republicans in the Senate. But let me also say this, that without the diversity visa program, any immigration reform bill will be anti-African and anti-black and will undermine the future flow of immigration from uh, the black, especially uh, Africa and Caribbean uh, part of the world. So please remember to sign the letter in support of diversity visa that you receive at the uh, registration desk. That is one simple action that we ask all of you to take today. And we'll send a letter to your member of Congress immediately after this summit. The more they hear from us, the better. And no one can do this but ourselves and our allies to make sure that we have a fair and inclusive immigration reform that does not simply appease one segment of the immigrant community and block path to future flow for others. As we focus on comprehensive immigration reform, my friends, let us also pay attention to the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program. Often escaping from bloody civil wars, refugees form uh, indeed the kind of community here that deserves our full attention. They come from faraway places like Iraq, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Burma, and Somalia, and arrive here with a single goal of establishing a home in security and dignity. The rate at which they achieve this goal is a function of how well the rest of us support refugee integration with the resources and services they need to thrive in this society. That is why we as an organization play a leading role in the Golden Door Coalition, advocating for programs and policies that enhance refugee integration in Illinois and nationally. For too long, advocates for immigrant rights have tended to ignore refugee issues as if immigrants and refugees are from different planets. That attitude must change in both our articulation of issues and prioritization of organizing and advocacy resources. My friends, the, this year's summit is taking place against the backdrop of events in Africa that threaten peace and stability across the continent. In Nigeria, we saw the disappearance of over 250 schoolgirls. This deplorable act by Boko Haram has been condemned worldwide, but unfortunately nothing has changed on the ground to bring back our girls. We continue to witness genocidal attacks on the Muslim minority in the Central African Republic, and Libya continues to slide into anarchy after the NATO-led regime change intervention. But again, these issues remind us about the unfinished business of forging ahead to build a united and democratic Africa. The big question of our time is, when will Africa unite? And I tell you, the question can only be answered based on our collective will as Africans to accelerate the march towards the United States of Africa. That is going to be the greatest bulwark against foreign intervention and Western control over our resources and our lives. A truly independent Africa will emerge only when we build a united state of Africa, one nation for one African people in our time. That is the answer. That is the way that we can avoid another recolonization of Africa, the destabilization of African economies, and of course, the enforced migration of so many people as part of this refugee flow. At this juncture, my friends, I would like to thank our many supporters and allies for standing with us in our work to promote African unity, empowerment, and development. 
Special thanks to the Illinois Department of Human Services, the Woods Fund of Chicago, the Chicago Community Trust, the Weibo Foundation, the Phil Foundation of Illinois, Polk Brothers Foundation, Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation of Illinois, Prudential Financial, and the Solidarity Fund. We deeply appreciate our long-standing partnership with many immigrant rights organizations, including the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, in all organizing legislative campaigns to give voice to the social justice aspirations of African immigrants and refugees in Illinois. And special thanks to our summit panelists this year. They are all highly respected experts in their fields, and uh, they are going to enrich our own perspectives on important issues affecting our community today. Finally, I would like to thank all the participating agencies in our community resource sphere. It is vital for us to connect our communities with the services that we need. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the United African Organization, I wish you a productive and rewarding time at the H Chicago African Summit and Resource Sphere. Thank you, and let's go out there to invent a new world. And on that note, I'd like to call upon a young activist in our community to give us her own words of welcome. Farima Samake is from Mali, and her story, I'm sure, will inspire all of us as we start this eighth summit on African immigrants and refugees. Farima, you got it. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How are you all doing today? My name is Farima Samaki. I'm from West Africa originally, Mali. I came to the United States when I was 14 years old with my mother. I came to seek a better education, and my mom also wanted me to have a better lifestyle. So did I. When I came, I did not speak any English. I had to learn how to speak English. I went to school. I started high school here. It was not easy because I was made fun of just because I did not speak English. I was told many different sarcastic things telling me to even go back where I came from, that I do not belong here. All that hurt. And I, sometimes I was very disappointed and I even started to believe what they said, that I don't belong here, I'm not one of them. And I started to realize what exactly is one of them. I belong wherever I go. So I took everything they said to me into consideration. At one point, I tried to commit suicide. And when I recovered, I just decided to take my own success into my own hands. I said, I don't need to fit in to be successful. I just need to be myself. And all those things they said to me made me realize I become a belong here more than any of them. I'm human being just like them. I'm black, we have the same skin color. And it just gave me so much more focus to take my own education and success. But when I graduated high school, even though I graduated as an honor student, I still, it was hard for me to go to college because I didn't have a social security. Every college I went to, they all asked for social security. They all asked me how I was going to pay for my education. And that was a struggle then. So I started to work at McDonald's. I didn't have any papers. Somebody did hire me. Even though they were fortunate enough to hire me, I was still getting underpaid, which I felt was just not fair. You know, even though you're doing me a favor, why do you have to underpay me? Why, and I felt being discriminated against. Because many people come to the United States to gain a better life for themselves, for their family. But the way the immigration system is now, families are separated. All immigrant workers are exploited. They are underpaid. Is that how we should be? America is a country of opportunity, a country of promise, which is why many of us come here to have a better lifestyle for ourselves, for our family. Who knows, even grandchildren, great-grandchildren, we deserve to stay in this country, and we need to have a better immigration system that will 
that will recognize hardship, hardworking people who aspire for citizenship in this country. Because I personally don't know any other country. I know I was born in Africa, West Africa, Mali. I grew up there until I was 14, and now I'm 24. This is my country. I've never been back there. This is what I know. I had to adapt to this society, to this economy. And I just know I am African originally, but I consider myself as American because this is the only country I know apart from where I came from. And immigration reform should be more because to me, immigration reform will bring more than $48 million in the federal tax in the next 10 years. I was working undocumented, I still pay taxes. All, I mean, all undocumented people that are here, we work, we pay taxes, we even pay more taxes than some citizens who are working here. And I just don't think we should be sent anywhere. We should be deported because we don't know. We can't go back where we came from. We've been living in this country for more than 10 years. What do we know from our own country? Nothing they will also disown us. But what I have to say now is, now I really have a better lifestyle. Thank you to Mr. Ali for supporting me all these years since I've been here. He's been a support to me in my, fun, in my educational system. Just last year, I was awarded as one of the recipient of Captain Albert Surge, Captain Surgeon Albert Scholarship. And Mr. Ali has been a big support to me since I've been in this country in my whole immigration system. So I'm asking all of you, you need to help us. You need to help us because we're all one people. We are united. We can do it once. And all immigrants are not just the Latinos. There are different people, Africans, Asians. But we don't come out because we are scared and the Latinos are not. That's why many people just be believe Latinos are the African, are the immigrants. But it's not just the Latinos. I've been scared my whole life to come out because just of what people have said to me in high school. And I was always scared to just step out, tell somebody I was undocumented. Even now, I'm still undocumented. But with President Obama deferred action for childhood arrival, I'm able to have a social security. I'm able to have a work authorization card. I can work legally. And I am not afraid to step out because I know my right. I'm not afraid to say anything if you're cheating me of what I deserve, of what I'm working for. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Farima. Thank you for that inspiring story. That's what this fight is about. It's for the future of people like Farima and so many people in our communities. That's why when we say immigration reform, we are not talking about an abstract formula. We're talking about people whose lives are impacted. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's very important for all of us to understand that uh, immigration reform is an imperative. You need to contact your members of Congress and let them know that uh, there should be no more delay. And in the meantime, remember, you can always call the White House and say you want President Obama to end the deportation right now. We can stop that while we are fixing the problem. Ladies and gentlemen, it now gives me a pleasure to call on representative, representative of the governor of Illinois, Pat Quinn, uh, Brother Chima, to read a statement from the governor for the 8th Chicago African Summit. Chima. Good morning. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here, uh, especially as a representative for the governor, but a representative for the governor who is also the son of immigrant parents from Nigeria uh, who came here in 1975 after a civil war. And so I have a special place in my heart for UAO and all the staff and the people that make events like this possible and provide the necessary services for our community. Uh, as many of you know, and I'll be brief, uh, we just got back from Springfield 
actually this morning the budget was passed and so the governor is still down there right now ready to sign off on it uh, but he wanted to make sure that we were represented here and I took it upon myself and he commissioned me to come here so he wanted me to read this statement uh, on his behalf. Greetings. As the governor of the state of Illinois, I am pleased to welcome everyone gathered for the eighth annual Chicago Summit on African Immigrants and Refugees and Community Resources Fair hosted by the United African Organization. As the premier coalition of African national associations promoting social and economic justice, civic participation, and empowerment of African immigrants and the refugee community, you have helped countless new Americans adjust to their new homes, integrate into new communities, and empower them by providing tools and the knowledge that they need to participate in civic life. Today's event will bring together community members to have a constructive dialogue about issues that impact the African community in Illinois, and I am certain that the knowledge acquired by everyone in attendance will be beneficial in our continued pursuit to provide opportunities for African communities here in Illinois. On behalf of the people of Illinois, on behalf of the people of Illinois, I offer my best wishes for an enjoyable and memorable summit. And I appreciate the opportunity once again to be here and to represent the governor's office and central manager services uh, later on today. Thank you. We thank the governor for his message. We knew that he was uh, planning to be here with us, but the budget issue, as we all know in the state of Illinois today, the budget is, well, the budget is the budget. <laughs> And uh, we are really happy that uh, something was done late last night and he's still in Springfield. So Mr. Governor, we want to thank you for acknowledging and respecting our community here in the great state of Illinois and we will continue to be part of this great land of Lincoln to fight for an Illinois that is inclusive and making sure that African voices are heard. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I want to call upon the, our staff, Anthony, to start the ball rolling with our first First panel here, and that's uh, Sandra. Where's Sandra? Come on, Sandra, and start the ball rolling. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Thank you, Ali and uh, Farima, for those inspira uh, inspirational words. Um, welcome again to the eighth Chicago African Summit and Resource Fair, and in particular, welcome to our immigration panel. I would like to welcome my, my two panelists uh, to come onto the stage. We have uh, Shaban Albiol, who is with the, um, let's give them a warm welcome. <laughs> Um, Shoban Albiol uh, serves as the Asylum and Immigration Law Clinic Instructor and Coordinator uh, and as the Legal Resource Project Director at the DePaul Asylum and Immigration Law Clinic. This is a very important resources, a resource for us. Um, they work with community-based organizations like United African Organization and provide trainings and technical assistance for our communities. And sitting next to her is Dr. Erku Yamer, who is the executive director of the Ethiopian Community Association of Chicago. He is a friend and ally of United African Organization, and he has been fighting for refugee rights for 30 years. So please, again, welcome our two panelists. Each speaker will have 10 to 15 minutes to speak, and then that will give, give us 15 minutes for questions and answers. So, Shaban, if you could please. Uh, you can. Yeah, in the interest of time. Um, thank you so much for having me. First of all, it's so nice to be here with Sandra, um, with whom DePaul Legal Clinic partners on um, trying to enhance capacity of legal services providers in... Can you hear me now? Hold it close like that, okay. And then you'll hear me exhale, right? Um, 
So as I mentioned, uh, UAO, we're privileged to partner with them at DePaul Legal Clinic on trying to provide legal services to low-income immigrants and refugees uh, throughout the Chicagoland area, and it's so wonderful to have Sandra as a partner in that endeavor. Um, both Farima and Ali are hard acts to follow. I feel like I'm not sure what else I can tell you on immigration, and asylum, and refugee issues that Ali hasn't already addressed so powerfully and persuasively. Um, Sandra, when she invited me today, asked me to speak to you about asylum issues. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about those and then also about some other topics. I want to make sure I leave time for all your good questions. Um, you know, at the Asylum and Immigration Law Clinic, what I do is uh, train students to work with asylum seekers from all around the country. And we represent, in very limited numbers, um, asylum seekers before the asylum office and also in deportation proceedings. And we also have a partnership with a number of community-based organizations to provide immigration services, to provide technical assistance to orgs who provide immigration services. I thought I'd just um, kind of go over some points or facts that may be of interest to you. Um, you know, every year, every quarter, uh, the asylum office and the immigration courts publish statistics on where asylum seekers are coming from, um, you're almost always going to see the same countries in the same top 15 places if you go back for a decade, probably, in terms of where asylum seekers are coming from into the U.S. And so this is based on immigration court statistics um, for 2013. Um, I also want to just make a point about um, it's not only adults, but it's also children who are seeking asylum in the United States. And this issue of unaccompanied minors coming to the United States, so children who come to the United States without parents or guardians, um, or who perhaps have been subject to abuse, neglect, or abandonment by parents or guardians, come in increasing numbers into the United States. Um, this year, I was working with an asylum seeker from Africa, and he asked me what the students and I were going to be doing over spring break. And every spring break, uh, the students and I go to South Texas to volunteer at a program that serves individuals in detention. And in South Texas, um, which is a point of entry for immigrants and refugees from all over the world, not just Latin America, not just Central America, but from Asia, from Africa, from all over the world. Um, the number of children that we see there in South Texas and the number of children that we see there being held in shelters continues to increase and the number of facilities continue to increase. There's um, a number of scholars and researchers who've written on this issue. And um, I just draw your attention to the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies, which is at UC Hastings. It's done a recent report. And you can see just the number of kids coming into the United States on their own are coming in increasing numbers. And the unique thing about uh, children in our immigration system is, as I think all of you know, in immigration and removal proceedings, um, an individual has a right to counsel, but not a counsel, not an attorney paid for by the government, right? An attorney you have to seek yourself, either a free attorney or a paid attorney, and that's no different for kids, right? So there's no appointed counsel for kids. There's no kind of best interest determination in the immigration context for kids. Um, and having to navigate the immigration system as a child without a parent or guardian present to help you do that is certainly an overwhelming task. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how asylum seekers come to the United States because it impacts the current phenomenon that we're experiencing uh, with asylum seekers. So um, some people come in you know, through nor regular means. They've been lucky enough to obtain a, a visa, maybe a temporary visa, maybe a tourist visa, a student visa, taken advantage of that opportunity to come to the United States, and then later either they came with the intention of applying for asylum or circumstance change, and now they need to apply for asylum. You know, I mentioned um, having experience working at our southern border and just the numbers of undocumented, I mean, people come through our northern border as well, right? It's not just our southern border, but the number of individuals who come undocumented uh, through our borders and individuals that I work with who come undocumented and present themselves at ports of entry seeking asylum, asking for asylum from, from an asylum officer. Um, and certainly 
being able to enter the United States through fraudulent documents, although I feel like you know, post-September 11th, this is harder and harder to do, right, with all the protections on types of documents. Why I want to talk about the way that people enter is because currently um, in the United States, at ports of entry across the United States, um, under our laws, if someone presents himself at O'Hare, if someone presents themselves at El Paso with a, a visa to enter the United States, and that visa is questioned whether or not the person has that actual intent of coming into the United States as a tourist, as a student, and whatever, um, if there's some doubt as to the validity of that visa, or if someone presents themselves without any documents, then they're subject to expedited removal, which means being returned to their home country without any kind of hearing. And that's true unless someone articulates at that port of entry, so imagine you know, being in secondary inspection, being in a room with a Customs and Border Patrol officer at O'Hare, unless at that point the person articulates a fear of returning to the home country. Um, and then once that fear is articulated, the person's placed in removal proceedings, um, placed in detention, which in, the, in, in Illinois means being placed in a, in a county jail during the duration of removal proceedings, and will eventually get a hearing before an immigration judge. Why I'm mentioning this procedural piece is that currently in the United States, and certainly in Chicago, there's been an increase in credible fear interviews, so an increase in the number of apprehensions and people being placed in removal proceedings, not only for individuals who are presenting themselves for the first time, but there's also a separate similar process for individuals who've previously been deported from the United States and are now coming back to a port of entry. They're also placed under a similar process and given something that's slightly different called a reasonable fear interview. Both reasonable fear interviews and credible fear interviews are increasing um, across the United States. And what that means is I'll come back to this in a second. What that means is there's a tremendous backlog in terms of um, actually being able to have your case heard as an asylum seeker, right? So an increasing number of individuals being placed in removal proceedings, an increasing number of individuals uh, claiming a fear of returning to the home country, but no necessarily commensurate increase in the number of asylum officers or immigration judges to hear those claims, right? So in Chicago currently, and this applies not just to asylum seekers, but anybody in removal proceedings in Chicago. In Chicago, there's an average, uh, there's a great uh, resource, Syracuse University has this uh, transactional record center that keeps track of backlogs in immigration courts across the country, and in Chicago, it's a wait of about 700 days before you get in front of a judge to present your claim. So if you can imagine, right, uh, an asylum seeker who comes to the United States either doesn't get a chance to go before an asylum officer or is referred to removal proceedings by an asylum officer having to wait years before they have their claim heard. And oftentimes, you know, that's years of separation from a spouse or child or family members in the home country, right? And a delay and reunification of those family members in coming to the United States. So the immigration court backlog is uh, tremendous and in the past, six months uh, to eight months probably, the Chicago Asylum Office is experiencing not a 700-day backlog, but a, a significant backlog in being able to hear cases. So the standard in Chicago used to be if you weren't in removal proceedings, you filed an asylum application and you um, wanted to have your case heard before an asylum officer, maybe you'd wait 30 days, maybe you'd wait 60 days before an asylum office interview. Now it's more like six months, some cases are even uh, up to a year for that. Um, and it's because those asylum officers, their job is to also hear those credible fear and reasonable fear interviews. So they're addressing those cases where individuals have been apprehended, and so all the other asylum cases kind of fall in the backlog. So something I just wanted to bring to your attention um, on asylum issues. The other thing I, I wanted to bring to your attention on asylum issues is just the number of studies in the disparate outcomes um, amongst asylum offices and amongst immigration courts uh, um, 
in terms of grant rates, and there are a number of studies on this. Um, the, probably the most well-known study is called Refugee Roulette, and I've cited it here. Um, but it seems that sometimes the outcome in an asylum case doesn't necessarily depend on the merits of the case, but may depend on the asylum officer, may depend on the judge, may depend on the jurisdiction. And even within asylum offices, you may have an asylum officer with a 10 percent grant rate, and you may have an asylum officer with a 90 percent grant rate. So there have been a number of studies talking about disparities amongst uh, outcomes for asylum seekers. Um, you know, um, significant, I, I think you're all familiar with the asylum definition. I have kind of the bullet points laid out here. The other kind of persistent issue in terms of asylum is, um, so in order to demonstrate asylum, an individual has to have been persecuted, so face or will face a specific kind of harm in the home country on account of a protected characteristic, right? So a past harm or a fear of future harm based on some characteristic that that individual possesses, race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion. And this comes from the refugee definition, um, which Dr. Yurko knows, Dr. Yimer knows much more about than I do, I'm sure. But, but that's the basic definition. You know, I think most people can understand persecution on account of race, religion, nationality, political opinion. Those are kind of self-evident definitions. This last category, member in a particular social group, is kind of an abstract term. And what it's been interpreted to mean by the courts is having a common characteristic that can't be changed or should not be required to change as other members of the group. And there's significant debate across the country, across the courts, within the agency, and amongst the federal courts about what particular social group means. So the most common examples noted are, um, like I said, common immutable characteristic, such as kinship ties, uh, clan has been recognized as a particular social group, family membership, Gender, in theory, has been recognized as a particular social group, although most people are not granted protection just on gender alone. Sexual orientation or other categories. But this definition of particular social group um, is it's a hard concept for, for courts and for adjudicators to grasp and something um, that, that's litigated quite a bit. Um, the other significant thing I think for asylum seekers is that the law requires such specificity um, and the inquiry is uh, primarily focused on the credibility of the asylum seeker. And um, the issue with that is, in, in my work, is um, you know, uh, individuals who've undergone trauma or witnessed trauma in significant ways. Um, may not be able to tell the story right away or may not be consistent in the way that the story is told across time. And there are reasons for that, right? There are uh, neurological reasons for that. Um, and discrepancies sometimes in asylum case are given too much attention um, with regard to credibility without regard to those other factors. The other issue is that there's an expectation that people provide documentation of, of their claim, which when things happen, happen far away um, in areas of the world that don't have perhaps the same infrastructure, the same sisters, uniform systems of recording events or keep track, keeping track of records or the same resources to produce such records makes, makes it a significant obstacle. Um, I'd say a consistent issue with regard to asylum is the one-year filing deadline, um, which seems to me also at odds with this issue of someone who survived trauma being able to come forward and tell a very painful story within one year of arrival to the United States. But this one-year deadline knocks a lot of people out of asylum eligibility. Um, I think just in the interest of time, I'm going to leave it there and turn it over to Dr. Yerko, and I'll welcome your questions not just on asylum, but on other immigration topics as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shaban. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like really to recognize 
what uh, United African Organization is doing with its leader Ali, uh, a series of efforts to bring together Africans has been going on. Uh, I know it is very hard to bring Africans together. I have been there. And uh, just my advice is to persist. One day we may hit the jackpot, you know. There are plenty of Africans in this city and uh, if they participate and if they are organized, they can move the mountains. Uh, having said that, uh, I just wanted to make a distinction between refugees and immigrants because in my work, uh, there is always some kind of confusion. Refugees are people who are outside of their country, recognized as refugees by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. Uh, in most cases, particularly Africans, they are warehoused under inhuman conditions. Many of them have been in the refugee camp for 20 years, 30 years. The case in point is the Burundi refugees who were camped in Tanzania for 30 years or more. Uh, but refugees have no choice, you know, they, they are fleeing uh, a country from persecution. And uh, it could be political, it could be religious, it could be ethnic or any other any other kind of persecution. Uh, but when it comes to refugees, uh, they are highly motivated. They want to, to improve their lives. Uh, they migrate to the United States through various means. For Africans, it is the diversity visa. The diversity visa. For uh, some people who have refugee families here, family reunion is also another option. Uh, so they come here, they wanted to work or go to school and improve their life. Uh, they are determined and uh, they know what to do. But refugees, uh, they have no knowledge where they come from, uh, where, 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 which countries are going to be resettled. There are presently about six or seven resettlement countries. Uh, most of them Northern Europe, Scandinavian countries, Canada, Australia, United States. Recently, Brazil uh, has joined that, that group. Uh, currently, there are about 15 million refugees, 15.4 million refugees around the world. Uh, 3.2 of them are sub-Saharan Africans. It doesn't include North Africa, actually. Uh, when we talk about refugees, I think there is another element also that I need to mention, uh, internally displaced people in their own country. Their condition is even far worse than the refugees themselves because refugees receive some kind of assistance from the United Nations. But uh, those internally displaced people, their number is staggering. 28 million of them are internally displaced. And 10.4 of them come from Sub-Saharan Africa. Sudanese, Congolese, Somalis, and, and Chad, Darfurians, things like that. So this is the refugee situation. And uh, UNHCR, uh, uh, to promote the agony and the problem of these refugees, has uh, marked the date June 20 as Refugee Day, Worldwide Refugee Day. Uh, it has been celebrated for the last several years. And here in Chicago also, there is a preparation to celebrate that event. Uh, Refugee issues affecting uh, our communities are numerous. Uh, I will divide them between two 
pre-resettlement issues and post-resettlement issues. In pre-resettlement issues, uh, as I said earlier, uh, refugees are recognized by United Nations and U UNHCR. UNHCR refers clients, I mean refugees, to uh, resettlement countries. They are divided between three refugees themselves, P1, P2, and P3. P1 means uh, they are referred by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees for humanitarian reasons. They cannot return to their country. Uh, they are not willing to go to their country. So they refer to the resettlement countries. The resettlement countries uh, uh, accept them or reject them. That's how refugees come to this country. I think uh, Homeland Security, United States, uh, uh, USCIS citizenship and immigration uh, uh, department goes to the refugee camps interviews and if there is a reasonable fear of persecution, they just grant them asylum. Uh, Asylees are also here, but they are processed from the United States, but uh, regular refugees are processed in, the, in another country. Uh, then comes P2. P2 is a small number of people that are humanitarian interest to the United States. Uh, uh, special cases. They could be in groups. I think uh, uh, some, some group of Somali were uh, resettled by that kind of uh, P2, P1, uh, P2 program. P3 is uh, again a family reunion case. Here is a problem with uh, African migrant refugee communities. Uh, the refugees who have been resettled here earlier can uh, petition for their relatives in the refugee camps or in, the, in their own country. Uh, what happened is some seven, eight years ago, there was a DNA testing, there was some kind of fraud involved, and uh, petition for a fed bit of relationship was filled hundreds and thousands particularly Somali families. Uh, when they come, when they flee their country, one goes to Kenya, one, the other goes to Yemen, the other goes to Ethiopia. One of them gets resettled here, and the other family member stays somewhere in another country. So the refugees who have been resettled here can claim that relative to, to come here. So that's not happening because of this DNA testing. And, and also, the, it was blocked for several years and recently it was opened, but uh, nobody is coming. I think people have to refile again that affidavit of relationship. And by then, I think the refugee families have been relocated to another place and it becomes really very complex and impossible. Uh, these are some of the issues uh, that are being faced in pre-resettlement. And generally also, uh, Africa produces the largest number of uh, uh, refugees in many cases. Uh, sometimes, you know, the Middle East does that. Uh, at this current moment, I think Middle East is the largest refugee uh, group available now. Uh, the African numbers annually that the United States receives uh, are 14,000 at this current moment. Uh, uh, many, uh, the situation of the refugees in the refugee camps is such that they live under inhuman conditions and the Darfurians, the South Sudanese, the uh, Chad, uh, Somali, Eritreans, uh, all these people, plenty of refugees, but only a limited number, 14,000 annually come to the United States. I think that number needs to be increased, and the refugee community here, uh, they try to advocate, but they have no 
strong voices. I think the United African Organization is doing just that. Uh, this is a pre-resettlement issues that refugee community face. Uh, Post-refugee uh, issues, when refugees are resettled here, uh, they have to live life. Uh, uh, underemployment is a very serious problem for uh, African refugees. Uh, it is said that many African refugees are highly educated, doctors, engineers, nurses. Uh, they cannot practice medicine. Uh, they have to be, uh, they have to pass the uh, exam, trade exam, and uh, it, it becomes very difficult. They have to go. The, the, the only opportunity they have is to get entry level jobs that pay minimum wage. Uh, that becomes really very difficult. And, and they are underemployed, they are skillful, but that is the situation prevailing. Uh, the other problem African refugees face here after they are resettled is there are no adequate support systems. Uh, there are no churches as such. There are no uh, social services social service organizations. I think Ethiopians were the first people to arrive in large numbers as refugees. And uh, uh, when they come, first I remember, uh, there are no even restaurants, you know. Restaurants really play a major role for refugee communities because that is a meeting place. Uh, people exchange ideas and all that and also they become customers you know, to the restaurant owners. So there was no such thing, and they were just uh, left alone. Gradually, now, uh, thanks God, you know, the population is also increasing, as well as some refugee small businesses are developing. They become source of employment, too. For example, uh, Ethiopian Diamond Restaurant, which employs more than 20 people, uh, that is uh, that is a resource that the refugees, you know, can 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 uh, dip in. Uh, some refugees are really unemployable. Uh, when you th think about it, they cannot because limited of limited English, uh, of age, or skills. But these restaurants and the ethnic grocery shops are becoming you know, sources of employment for, for those kind of people, particularly for women. You know, they work in the kitchen, which they know very well. Uh, it, it is important, but the, still, still there are no enough organizations and, and support systems existing in the community. The other problem, I think, that uh, immigrant uh, refugees really face is health. Uh, uh, because of lifestyle changes, many refugee families uh, are contracting diabetes. Uh, it is widespread. Uh, access to health services is very limited because partly because of knowledge, information, lack of information, partly because people don't know how to go about it. So. These are the kind of uh, issues that we have after resettlement. Uh, you know, the refugees are starting to form organizations, but uh, their life span is maybe one year, two years. Most of them die immediately after they are created because of lack of res resources. Uh, some, really, the trend is to start small businesses, uh, traditional small businesses, you know, mainly restaurants, ethnic spices, and all that clothing. That's how the, they survive. Uh, uh, one thing very good about refugees is they want to maintain their culture and pass 
that culture to their children. It is no more assimilation, melting pot. It is integration, taking from the mainstream society some, giving their own culture also some. Uh, uh, I, I think the restaurants are playing really a major role in that case. Uh, if you take Ethiopian restaurants, it has become the delight of the mainstream society. Many people enjoy it. Uh, they eat, they go. Uh, it's just a give and take. And uh, I think in the interest of time, I should stop here. Thank you.